Okay, Earth Anchors, Solutionaries, we are back for week number, is this officially four? Is this number four. four, Shelly? Mm -hmm. um, I am Dr. Tatiana Irvin, and I am here with Soul Sister in Earth Anchoring, Shelly Whitehouse. Shelly. Hello, everybody. Welcome, Welcome our to people. our conversation. Welcome to our conversation. There is not a boring week in any aspect of this series, and there is obviously no way to contain the level of content because this is just meant to give you sound bites. This is meant to get the conversation going and rolling in your feedback. We know that we're going to have to be equally concise with today's topic, which is renewable cycles, renewable cycles. Mm -hmm. What does renewable cycles mean? Well, many of us know that we live in a 12 month calendar. We know that we deal with 12 to 24 hour cycles. We know that the seasons bring renewable cycles for us. And we know that our human bodies go through cycles from childhood to adolescence, you know, and, and prepubescence and into childbearing or child rearing years and adulthood. And for women in particular, we know that there is in that reproductive and fertility cycle, the maiden, the matron, and the crone. I mean, we can just go through so many of those that are so obvious to us that many of us would never even think to question. But because of how we're taught, or perhaps because of how little we're actually taught about much larger macrocosmic cycles that take place on this earth and take place cosmologically or, or astrophysically, we would become maybe more un, unnecessarily inflamed, concerned, um, anxious about larger cycles that are taking place during this evolutionary time that we're all in that would be extremely pertinent to this conversation and part of why we need to talk about renewable cycles and anchoring our peace as new earth anchors. Before we kind of jump into some images that will encapsulate this conversation, is there anything you want to touch on, Shelley, just in some of the obviousness of renewable cycles that you think that we maybe didn't touch on just now that are part of the conversation? Um. Well, I, I, I love this um, topic today because some, so much of this, you know, cosmological viewpoint is, is um, it's new. It's like, a, it's a, it's like, I'm just learning to grasp the actual, the enormity of it and the simplicity of it, that it's always been there. Mm. It just hasn't been our focus, right? You know, our focus tends to be what's right in front of our face as opposed to what so there's these um, cycles that are actually driving a larger um, rhythm yeah. that we haven't been aware of. Right. And, and let's be honest, we are going to have to be really kind and patient with ourselves. And we're asking our audience, our students to do the same thing. What's in front of your face is mostly chaos in today's day and age. It's technology that's coming at you too quickly. If your phone is anywhere near you, you are going to have a bombardment of anything from instant messages to FaceTime to text to emails to your phone ringing, heaven help you that someone calls you, um, and, and the digital world that is always trying to advertise something to you. So for you to get back into the rhythm of the cycles is to have them reintroduced to you in a manner similar to what Shelley and I, and I are doing right now. There is a natural world and there is a magic to the astronomy and the cosmological world that we are all a part. And a lot of it we take for granted and a lot of it we just don't see because it isn't reintroduced to us on a constant basis. Mostly we're being introduced to chaos and distraction. So it is of imminent importance that we get into some of these renewable cycles. And so for the sake of the conversation, we're gonna start with some cycles that we probably as bystanders are aware of, but we don't really think about. I'm going to do a screen share right now, and I'm going to show just a few of those that I think will be immediately pertinent. And I'm going to count on Shelly to let me know. Is this clear? Are we seeing mm -hmm. this picture as large as we possibly can? Yes. Okay. So Clint Ober, philosopher, all natural things grow and are influenced by the natural cycles of heaven, ki, or chi, depending on 
your persuasion and earth key or chi. What does that mean? It is as a general umbrella statement, what Clint Ober is actually saying is, if you stop looking at chaos, you will find patterns and order in the chaos. There are patterns and order that astrophysicists look for. There's patterns and order that geologists look for, patterns and order that microbiologists look for in our bodies. So from heaven and earth into the microcosm of our own cellular intelligence, there are beautiful cycles and repetitive patterns like Fibonacci sequences, very much like mathematical patterns, numbers like the golden ratio that show up again and again. And if we had more time, we could talk about that alone. But I want to explain why this is pertinent to being an earth anchor right now, especially as we are going to be um, enticed to look and listen to the chaos that is put in front of us, mostly by mainstream and very often by um, inadequately written articles and um, other pieces of scientific soundbite data that don't give us the whole picture that could lead to us being anxious or inflamed when in actuality that doesn't serve us and the data is incomplete. I'm going to go back to something that many of us have heard of before. There was this big, big um, draw towards the focus of the Mayan calendar and 2012. And not that that's irrelevant, but I just want to bring you to a place that the ancients understood the cycles. And they very often, because they understood them, could map them, and they could then make preparations based on those cycles, which is, as our thinkers, something that we are encouraging one another to do. Um, when you look at the Mayan template that you will see inside, um, you can actually see the, the classic um, pictorials of a Mayan uh, calendar inside of an external set of rings that is known as the Hindu, Hindu yugas. The, the yugas are considered eras or ages, golden ages, dark ages, and various ages of growth and deprivation that take place in an eternal round that's considered macrocosmic. When you layer them together, what is really beautiful is that you can find that many, in many cases, they, they fall inside one another and they overlay beautifully. This is just an example of it. I don't want to go into reading all the details, but it goes into each of the yugas. And if you know how to read the Mayan calendar, then it's exciting to know, hey, you know, these distant and completely um, outside of the physical shared experience um, civilizations and not even necessarily living on the planet at the same time share these divine coordinates or these cosmological maps of the renewable cycles. And they knew about them, they planned for them. And because of that, there was not only preparation, there was greater peace of mind. We're going to go back over um, in our classes that uh, Shelley and I discuss at Earth and Equus and some of the evolving education. We'll talk about these a little bit more. But here's some of the cycles that many of us don't think about. Many of us might live, if we have our own property and we've got our own little plot of land and we're sitting on, you know, a, a different patch of, uh, maybe in a, in a neighborhood, we're sitting on a little patch of, of grass and sprinkler systems and some plants and some trees. We're not as familiar with some of the basic cycles. This is the carbon cycle. Geologists are very comfortable and familiar with some of this science. It, it comes to understand how carbon is sequestered, how carbon is emitted into the atmosphere, how we turn some of the current science or the current um, systems like fossil fuels is demonstrated here and what it, what it does to carbon sequestration as, as opposed to carbon being released into the atmosphere and impacting our ozone, which we all hear so much about. Um, how does it move through our atmosphere and back into the earth sphere? coming back into our vegetation, being sequestered by the soils, being pulled into our water table, coming back up through our water table as vapor, coming down as rain. We understand, those of us that study um, some of these geological earth cycles, that we have a carbon cycle. And a healthy carbon cycle can allow for a lot of human development in terms of processing different chemicals or um, different levels of um, making our world fueled within boundaries, within reason, in a way that isn't toxic to the planet. So those that study carbon sequestration will tell you 
um, having a healthy carbon cycle is important and knowing how to bring the carbon back into the planet rather than releasing it into the atmosphere for a healthy ozone is very important. Big topic. We're going to move on a little bit. Mm -hmm. The next one is a nitrogen cycle. Well, why is a nitrogen cycle important? We're not going to talk about it too much, but it has to do with the fact that everything that grows eventually needs to go through its full season and it's blooming. And then it needs to go through maturation. It needs to die back. It needs to decay on the earth. It will attract insects and pests that will break it down and return to the biomass that is in the soil and feed the soil so that the next generation can come up. Most of us would never question the nitrogen cycle. Um, I've been studying the work of Greg Braden, who is a world-renowned geologist. He goes on the traveling circuit. In fact, I don't think there's a month this year where he is not in some foreign exotic country um, teaching on some of these earth changes that we're going through and what they really mean when you have better science. Recently, I was studying um, Randall Carlson and he gets into sacred geometry and again, looking for the patterns within patterns, which you can't miss because certain key numbers come up all the time in a cosmological way and also in a way that we would, as human beings, adhere to time and basic mathematics that show up again and again. And I want to get to this piece and then open it up, Shelley, because this is really important. Many of us have been told that we're in um, climate change. What the word used to be, that's kind of the politically correct term now, climate change, cl climate change. It was called global warming before that. And um, as we become more aware and as we went from deniability, which is always, again, another cycle, what happens when we hear new information that we don't like, very often we're shocked and we go into resistance and denial, and then we come through that to um, going through the depression of new information or the anxiety of new information before we move into acceptance. I mean, everything is in cycles, which is such a gorgeous way that we're gonna stay in the loop of, of seeing the, the symmetry in this particular um, segment for today. But when it comes to understanding that it is more than just what pop culture is telling us. It's more than what Al Gore you know, gave us in his documentary. It's more than what you're hearing on Fox or CNN or NPR. If you really take the time to talk to the geologist, they'll tell you, we have done very intensive uh, uh, soil sampling, and in this case, ice core sampling, that went into two mile deep sheets of ice that had been left in, in a state of stasis that was, um, that was unadulterated. It was as pure as it could be so that it was going to give us the cleanest sample. And up in Greenland, this is an example, this oxygen isotopes in Greenland, to demonstrate how the temperatures changed over the last 20,000 years. This is a 20,000 year cycle as I understand it and as I pulled up on his website, Randall Carlson and Sacred Geometry um, International. The first half of this graph is the last 10,000 years. And if you drop down to the second, you can see that where there is this median line that's kind of over to the left, left the, or excuse me, to the right that looks kind of like a dash, that is um, a gradient temperature that would be considered kind of the mean, an ideal temperature for cultivating life on Earth. If you drop down past that 10,000 year period, if you take a look at that, you know, we hear about, oh my gosh, one to two degrees and the ice caps are going to melt. All hell's going to break loose on the planet. Well, we've actually demonstrated for about the last 10,000 years. That is not true. We have not varied more than just that slight little tick that you're seeing back and forth um, for the first upper half of the graph that we have actually maintained within just a few degrees, back and forth, back and forth, a little warming, a little cooling, a little warming, a little cooling. But what happens when we get to the lower half of the graph? You will actually see why we have been told that they have found woolly mammoths with fresh grass in their stomachs. You will see radical cooling or freezing is really the more accurate term and radical returns to a median in the, in the screen. If you look down from that first pivot to the left, you'll see that it came all the way back to that mean before it jutted out again and we started being in what many would refer to as a mini ice age. So why is, that, why is that relevant? I'm going to stop the screen share for a minute um, just after getting to Randall Carlson's comment in Sacred Geometry International. A cosmic tempo based on sacred geometry encoded in myth and mystical architecture throughout the earth governs the unfolding of world ages. 
the rise and fall of civilizations and is ultimately the very basis of apocalyptic prophecy. So those are all big, big buzzwords. But the fact of the matter is, is many of us are aware because we went to primary school, Sunday school, we had parents that were of a certain religious persuasion. If you follow any of the major spiritual philosophy, there is predictions and prophecy that is laden in it that have a lot to do with the changes that we're seeing on the planet right now. And what the larger picture will show you, and I'm not an, ex, I'm not a, an expert of the larger picture, I'm the student, and I'm the very, very humble, um, humble student of the larger picture of the geologists and the astrophysicists and cosmolog uh, cosmological um, physicists that are out there. But they will tell you we have entered a time in a 26,000 year cycle of interplanetary climate change. We are in a space that would be considered from a Mayan calendar, from a Hindu calendar, um, a new era because of where we are, where we have moved in the actual galaxy at large and where the galaxy moving within a larger universe has moved and that we are part of an age where there will be some cleansing and some shifts and a need for just as much as the growth cycle happens on the planet and something comes up out of the ground as a new green sprig and comes into full bloom and then begins to, after its maturation, die back down and become the biomass that feeds the next generation. We are at that similar point in this yuga, in this age, and in this cycle. And it isn't meant to be feared, it's meant to be celebrated and understood, and again, anchored in a degree of peace. So that was a whole lot, really quick. I'm just gonna bring it back for a second, and I'm gonna give Shelly, my, my brilliant, my, my brilliant co-host here, a second to kind of help us break it down so that it makes more sense to each of us. Go, Shelly. Okay, I loved that, and um, yes, it was a lot, but you did a really nice job of um, bringing in the, the different elements of the historical elements of, isn't it interesting, you know, that the Mayans and the Hindus basically came to the same cycles of, uh, the same understanding of cycles and in the bigger picture without technology, without Google, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, without... And maybe so maybe just, because there was no Google exactly. to tell them what the answer was. They had to exactly. go within and discover it. I, I, and I wonder too, and this is a little bit off topic, but not really when in terms of anchoring, in, is because they, like you were saying, we have so much chaos. What we see right in front of our face is primarily chaos, is that they didn't have the, all of that chaos right in front of their face, that mm. the, the veil was thinner. It was easier for them to literally see the bigger picture yeah. um and and just and and know uh it's i think that part's fascinating in and of itself um so the your description and and i'm and i'm going to kind of just repeat it in my layman language as as i suggested earlier that you know i'm i'm did I not say i'm a layman that was that was my you layman did, and i appreciate that but then i feel like well i'm I'm a little bit behind that. So um, I, but I was able to really follow and I appreciate it. Um, I would like to, to go back a little bit about the mapping cycles. Mm -hmm. And and so is that what you think you see is happening in terms of our, is of our beginning to understand like what's happening here that yes, we're part of this bigger um, cosmological cycle. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening here. We might be hitting a mini, um, you know, warming age, which will flip back to an ice age, which, mm -hmm. you know, whatever's happening next. Um, so that, and then I, and then I want to talk about the anchoring process before we wrap up. Okay. So a couple of hot spots that you started to touch on that I think would be good for people to play with, for instance. Um, oh gosh, what did you just say that just had me, you were talking about how did the Mayans know it without Google, without technology. And I would argue that, that Google is the chaos. Google is the distraction. Google, actually, its founders have made the statement that we should be able to, when you Google something, give you one answer. Well, what that means is they want to be the stewards of truth. Mm -hmm. And that means the answer that serves them will be the answer that the mainstream knows. What's beautiful about the Mayan and the Hindu is that they had oral traditions. And within those oral traditions, they passed down, like most indigenous people of the earth, that that were naturally earth anchors. They never lost it. They didn't need to reclaim it. It was always a part of their inherent 
way of life. Mm -hmm. They understood that the earth went through cycles. They passed it down orally from their, their maybe shaman or their wise sage woman, whatever it happened to be. And they would be then more and more prepared for when some of these yugas would change or these ages or these cycles would come in. And many even here in the United States, because I know a lot of our audience is in the United States, um, many of the indigenous people have talked about the fact that during these great cataclysmic ages, they have a written and an oral history inside caves and inside of in interior caverns of their people, of their tribes being taken underground by beings that live in the earth that brought them into the earth to preserve them from the earthquakes from the, the, you know, the water cataclysms, whether it had been melt-offs or it had been oceans rising or mountains falling, um, whatever it happened to be. So they were able to predict with a level of accuracy when they were coming so that they could make reparations that included living into the, in the inner cavities of the earth. So it's beautiful. If you, if you go down that rabbit hole and we can in earth and equus, and we do in some of my other teachings, it's exciting to know that some of the things that we've lost we're always a part of their ongoing um, living and surviving and even thriving on an ever-changing cyclical planet. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the first piece that I wanted to touch. Tell me where you wanted to go from there. You were talking about how to synthesize the cycles. Well, I, um, about the mapping. Mm. Um, but, you were, but you were talking about how the, the stories of them being able to share uh, their... their um, written history and mm -hmm. through, or I mean their oral history mm -hmm. through their shamans and, and passing it on. And also I, I have a feeling, like you said, like they never lost their connection or their feeling, their knowing, mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. just their, their greater knowing their connection to uh, a higher um, spirit. They were, they were sentient connected, weren't they? They yes. were, they were the yes. ultimate earth anchors. Shall I like I that know? sentient connected. Yeah. They were the ulti oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So the other thing I wanted to, um, so you brought sing traffic jam of thoughts. Um, <laughs> how does, uh, and, and I'll, this might be a whole nother conversation, but how does, um, our process of evolution mm -hmm. and how we see ourselves evolving you know, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, like physically, our, we, our physical countenance has changed so much over the last even 50 years. We mm -hmm. physically look, humans look different mm -hmm. than they did 50 years ago. Horses and dogs look different than they did 50 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so much, uh, I was just at the um, Safari Zoo out in San Diego and I, so I was thinking about evolution because there, there was some of these, some of these animals looked like, you know, horses from 40,000 years ago. And, and I was just thinking about the physical evolution mm -hmm. and I don't mean Darwinism because it's more than that. It's the whole epigenetics aspect of it, isn't it? I believe so. I have been told that there has been a very thoughtful foundational level of creation and that there is a level of variant species that in our own in our own ignorance as an evolving species ourselves we want to be able to you know encapsulate well this is what a horse should look like this is what a dog should look like and the fact of the matter is and, and or this is what this is what a squash should look like at the grocery store this is what a corn of cob should look like and the fact of the matter is that is completely and totally untrue. The bounty and the variation and the, the mosaic of choices on this planet in every level of sentience from the insect life and the, the variant of butterfly wings and dragonfly wings to the types of horses that have lived throughout the generations of time in the various epochs, as well as the evolutionary human have, have changed in, in ways, but have also been created in ways to experience various eras. So do we interbreed? Do we experience resiliency and being able to handle, you know, rougher climate? Do, does this woman from Great Britain's bloodline tan and freckle at the same time to deal with the North Carolina sun? Of course, but that doesn't change the specificity with which my creation came. So you were probably looking at this gorgeous confluence down there at the zoo of what was already created, what might have once been on the planet and is no longer, and how some of us 
um, create resiliency to just to stay during various ages, right, Shelley? Yeah. So it, in our uh, cycle, as we're as we're cycling and evolving, um, I'm starting. Yes, you know, my I guess my question is: so how do we um, notice that? How does our evolution help us anchor this process of entering a new cycle? And this that's a big question. And I'm not saying you it know is. you have the answer, but I'm saying. Isn't Let's that an make interesting that a, can, question? Can we table that and make that part yes. of the ongoing conversation? Yeah, I, I like think that. it's so important that we really should create an entire segment out of that. And because right. the renewable cycles is so macrocosmic in terms of anyone that studied the golden ratio, anyone that studied Fibonacci sequences, um, will will recognize that the spirals are an inherent celestial pattern. And that's really what we're talking about right here. So why is that going to be relevant to anchoring peace? Because many of us that know that there are unprecedented floods, floods taking place in areas of India right now, that there are typhoons over the Pacific that are in record number, never um, with a precedent to have beat or, or to have surpassed it. And those that are paying attention to the world trends and temperature, um, May, June, and July of 2019 are the hottest months on record ever. Ever, as far as we've been monitoring temperature this last May, June, and July. Now, that's not to say that the months before that weren't. I just want to be concise. When the news comes out and says, this is what's happening, you know, there was this, this dust cloud over Paris and it was 107 degrees, 108, 112. People are dying. The floods are creating food short shortages for us. There is an unnecessary antagonism that is provocative of us to feel anxious. And on top of that, there's a blame game that, that the media plays, which is it's you and your SUV. It's you and your cheeseburgers and your children and too many cows that are, that are giving off toxic gas into the sky. It is um, the level of burning pollution and, and oil refineries. Now, what I want to say respectfully, and, and every geologist that I follow says, has the human impact on the planet, the, the footprint they put on the planet impacted the planet? And all of them will say, absolutely, Obs absolutely. But I want to say to the listener, to the viewer, number one, the corporations have to take the vast majority of the blame for toxifying and polluting this planet. The corporations that have pushed their way through big money lobby, through the world governments to be able to dump their waste, whether they are coal or they are pharmacy or they are oil, literally are leading the way in toxifying this planet. And you and I did not vote on that. And you and I had no say in how that took place. And even if we wanted a Tesla vehicle five, six, seven, eight years ago, I'm sorry, Elon did not make a vehicle that the average American or even the average world citizen could drive. I'm sorry if you come out with, with vehicles that are solar, that are, well, that are, you know, that are pa powered in such a way that you can use the solar and they're the cost of a house it has not been made applicable for the rest of us to get on board, to be able to be making a better contribution towards minimizing that footprint. So when we get blamed, the taxpayer, the citizen, the consumer, and you see that perpetuated at you again and again, it is to make you feel culpable and make you feel helpless. And it does not serve right. your empowerment as an earth anchor. You want to touch on that one at all, Shelley? I just really want to, pull the rug out from underneath that one because it's BS. It's BS. Yes. yes, I totally agree with that. And, you know, I deal with that by just not watching the news or watching it in, you know, very small sound bites. Um, it, it, God, there's so much to go. To, there's so much here um, just in terms of, you, you know, yeah, there's these um, energy efficient vehicles, but do you know how much energy it takes to make one of those vehicles? <laughs> Right. Do you know what the carbon imp impact is to make a Tesla? So right. anyway. Right. And what's the agenda behind it? So this is why we're doing what we're doing, Shelly. This is why Shelly works in the capacity that she does with the land, with the horses, with the sentience that keeps them in harmony so that they continue to um, be anchors in and of themselves and um, 
and, and act in a therapeutic and in a grounding way for all those that come in to their space. She can't rush around them. She has to keep her energy in harmony because they pick up on it. it this, is, this is why I do the work that I do and why she and I are sharing in this work and why the videos are going to continue to come out. We're going to tell you what you can do to be earth anchors and what not to listen to if it is only going to confuse further ridicule and, and quite honestly, remove you from the path of solutions based um, yes. application. And to take you as an earth anchor out of the blame cycle yeah. of, of blaming yourself, blaming, you know, <sighs> blaming the other political party. Don't blame. Yeah. And, and so what is, is here it is where you talked about acceptance earlier and I was literally writing about it yesterday. So it's this, this opportunity to accept what is, and that's how we'll change our future. Mm -hmm. If we continue to be anxious and angstful about everything that's happened in the past, I don't care if it was five minutes ago or 5,000 years ago, mm -hmm. that anxiety will just create an anxious future. I think so, Shelley. And, and this is to be a big supporter and advocate. And I, I want to speak for both of us on this. We're, we're both a huge supporter and advocate for those that want to drive, you know, a low impact vehicle that is a hybrid. We're, we're all about you recycling your plastic bags. We're all about you building an earth ship or living in a tiny home if you want Eating to. Eating more clean vegetables and drinking clean water. And, you know, yes. Empower yourself right where you can in the life that you're in now. But if we look at and listen to the chaos and the distraction coming at us and we're not aware of the the deeper science and the deeper cycles of this planet we can lose hope and we already have too many people on this planet that are hopeless or are agitated and and fiercely angry at their neighbor and it's propaganda and it doesn't bring us together and it doesn't serve us so we just we had to take that that sound bite that could be a really bitter pill and put a love sandwich around it and kind of set it to the side and say all right first we're going to get out of the blame and we're gonna acknowledge that politics and global greed as usual is creating most of the toxicity, not the average human being. And we're gonna put that aside for a minute and then we're gonna go a little bit deeper. What do some of these cycles mean? Let's assume that we are working our best on good nitrogen sequestration and carbon sequestration, and we're doing our best on, on the planet as we speak. That will not change what the ice cores have shown and what the ancients through their wisdom traditions have shown are part of the earth cycles that we go through because we are not an isolated alone little planet in a great black cosmos sitting still on the contrary we are one with a smaller solar system within a larger solar system many of you don't even realize that we're solar systems within solar systems um, Jupiter alone has how many moons? It's its own solar system unto itself. So is Saturn. And that isn't typically taught in, um, in, mm -hmm. in classes, but we are, we are affecting on one another. The magnetics are changing and having an impact and it is part of a greater celestial cycle. Some would say that the ultimate cycle is the 26, almost 26,000 year cycle that is known globally and is represented all over in, in places that you would least expect, including on Hoover Dam and this gorgeous facade of granite and brass. And it's called the Great Elliptical Year. And you've got two brass statues with their arms up to the sky. And it's all about this next level of ascension and this next level of evolution. Why would they spend $100,000 building this walking under the Hoover Dam? If the, the founders of our, our great nation and the investors in these types of projects did not know some of the things that the ancients have known that mm -hmm. we've since lost. They know, they know. So what's to me exciting, yes, I was there and yes, I noticed it and nobody told me to go look for it. I just noticed it, took a picture and went hot diggity. Can you believe how often you run into this? And, and why isn't this taught more? Which is why Shelly and I are here. So how do we come to peace with these cycles? How do we handle the fact that food shortages are most likely coming because we've had impacts to the crop, to the planting, to being able to keep the soil either dry or wet, um, or our trades and agreements that have nothing to do with Trump and, you know, various unions and, and sanctions, but literally how we grow food, how we care for our bodies. We want to bring our audience, we want to bring our students back to this really yummy place of at any given time on this planet, there will be cyclical changes. 
-hmm. They're microcosmic within you. They're part of your particulate intelligence and part of your cellular intelligence and part of your emotional, mental, and spiritual development. And then they are part of how your family evolves in their cycles and how you age in your physical body and how you get along with your neighbors and how the planet at large from this beautiful Fibonacci expansion mm -hmm. impacts everyone and is part of our reason for being here at this time. There will be ongoing cataclysmic experiences that are part of earth, the earth moving up in her evolution as she cyclically has done since she was born. And I don't even want to go into how many hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions of years she has, because it isn't relevant. Do we really need to know that? How do we serve those of us that are on the ground right now? If we accept that cycles within cycles exist, then we make every day count living in harmony with cycles rather than fighting cycles, rather than picketing the cycles because of misinformation and chaos. And instead, we start with, I'm going to love from here. I'm going to listen to the cycles from here. I'm going to live and breathe compassionately into my awareness of how to interpret and discern the cycles that are right here. And then I can expand onto my land. If I'm not paying attention to cycles in conflict inside my body, I'm going to get cancer and autoimmune disease. I have to pay attention to how my body is cyclically telling me. If it's saying, I can't eat this today, listen to it. That's the particulate intelligence, the sentience that you are saying, um, based on my cycles of building and, and fortifying and then cleansing and removing and, and, and going into a renewal phase, just like the carbon and the nitrogen cycles and everything else, there's gonna be times where you can't eat what you always eat. There's gonna be times where you don't do what you've always done because that doesn't serve the, the microcosm that you are that is always going to be telling you what is going to be in harmony with its level of growth in the moment. And earth anchors cannot go out and make a difference in the earth if they haven't started by anchoring in their own skin. Mm -hmm. So I'm beautiful. gonna pause right there. Yeah, beautiful level of awareness that um, we especially get to explore when we're working with the horses. So um, I think we need to say thank you to everybody. <laughs> We're there already, aren't we? We have, we have so many more conversation topics coming up. We do. But yes, thank you. We look forward to hearing from you. And uh, stay with us. This is uh, getting even yummier. I think we might go ahead and address what she was just chatting about and then pause for the, for the last piece of the segment, depending on Q&A, um, but go in exactly what you were talking about, this kind of evolutionary being in our bodies and our skin during these times. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. So thank you all. Go to our websites. Take a look at any of the previous submissions on YouTube. Please subscribe, like, share. If thank it you. meant something to you, it's going to mean just something to somebody else. Yes, Shelly? Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's so appreciated. All right. I'm going to bring us to a close. Okay. You are the solution. We're grateful that you're here with us. You're our community. We love you guys. Bye. Until next time. Bye.